Emily, it's great to have you on Neff Talk. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate the time. You are the Director of Social Work for Satellite Healthcare and supervise some 115 social worker colleagues. That's an enormous responsibility, Emily. It's an honor and a pleasure for me. I enjoy the work I do. I enjoy social work and, and the work we do with our patients. I was inspired to contact you by one of your colleagues who recommended your presentation at the Clinical Leader Forum. And that presentation was entitled, Why Don't Patients Just Do What I Want? I added emphasis there. And the subtitle was, Inspiring Patients to Adhere to their care plans. That sounds pretty straightforward, but in your work, it's very crucial. It is. I had told this story to help illustrate how empathy and simply listening are sometimes the most important tools and skills that we can employ with our patients. And it, it reminds us that patient care is just that. It's, a, it's about the patient and not about us or our goals. Even if our goals are for the patient's best well-being and health, we need to remember the patient is at the heart of what we do. That great advice may conflict with what the patient feels and their immediate needs, and the two of you may be actually on different timelines. That is, the patient is consumed with the moment, while you as a social worker are looking at the big picture and the long-term consequences of not adhering to the program. How do you resolve that? It can be a real process, actually, when we think about what we're talking about here is change, and change can be hard. It's a very human response to struggle with change, and at times this is due to our ambivalence, which is that feeling of having two minds about something, maybe wanting a change, but at the same exact time wanting to stay the same. And this was true with the story with Mr. Jones that I shared at that meeting. Mr. Jones's case history, which is fascinating and really intriguing, illustrates and dramatizes the whole concept of empathy and listening. Why is empathy important in healthcare? Doesn't it just promote health worker empathy fatigue, or is it a little more complicated than that? It's actually more complicated than that. One of my favorite researchers and storytellers, Brene Brown, talks about empathy and how it fuels connection and connects us to our own humanity. And in particular, she talks about empathy without judgment and how empathy without judgment promotes acceptance. And this is what I found with Mr. Jones. Another researcher that I've followed his work is Jamil Zaki out of Stanford, and he studies empathy, and he says they're actually three different kinds. One kind of empathy is empathic distance, where you listen too much and don't actually connect with the person. Another kind is empathic distress, where we do the opposite. We feel too much that it actually can lead to burnout and compassion fatigue. The final and third kind of empathy is this empathic concern, which is where we find the right amount of caring that builds the connection, and it actually decreases the, the possibility of burnout because it leads to what we all seek, which is compassion, satisfaction. This is what I believe brought all of us into the healthcare field and what keeps us waking up every morning is feeling that connection with our patients. How do you understand that you're actually getting through to a person, listening passionately with intent, and expressing and showing empathy, how do you know that you're actually getting through? One of the measurements we can take away is that sense of satisfaction that we may have from a connection with a patient and a conversation with a patient where I walk away feeling that, that I am a better person for having talked to that patient and a sense from the patient's experience and sharing with me that they feel more comforted, more calm, or more reassured from the conversation we had. Let's talk about Mr. Jones, the patient. Could you describe 
your initial engagement and how I believe that deteriorated over time, not the relationship, but his adherence to the treatment plan. In the beginning, when Mr. Jones started dialysis, he was uh, in his mid-50s and he was a very capable, intelligent man who knew about himself. And we all believed that the, our work as a team was to give him the information he needed to be successful on dialysis because we all assumed if we give him this information, that will equal success. And There's the magic word. Exactly. What we didn't do was we didn't ask Mr. Jones, this intelligent adult human being, what he thought would be success and what his goals were for his care and being on dialysis. And as you pointed out, making an assumption led us down the path that we were on. And it wasn't the same path that he was on. Oh, so you thought you were doing fine. Absolutely. I believe that acceptance of reality is a higher form of consciousness that sooner or later everyone gets the message about the consequences of a chronic illness. And of course, sooner is better. With Mr. Jones's case, however, he came to his own conclusions despite your best efforts, best professional efforts. Definitely. Mr. Jones knew his body. He knew how he felt. We didn't know how he felt. We knew what literature said. We knew what lab values were showing. And we believed we knew the best way forward for him. And what we didn't know was what was going on inside of him and what his own personal challenges and struggles and goals were. And that's where we were misled and we took the wrong path. Mr. Jones had a plan. He did. You told me earlier that during the first two weeks of treatment, he did everything just right. And then he began to come in only twice a week. He was skipping a treatment pretty much every week, but he said that he felt fine. But he said that he didn't need to come in for treatments more often. Where did you go on from there? That is where we started to understand there was something wrong, that we've given all the information. We've, we started banging our heads and, and wondering why. Why is there a change? Why is Mr. Jones not accepting this information we're giving and following the instructions we're giving? And that was about the time when I realized I hadn't sat down and asked him what was going on. And that was a turning point. Wasn't the issue for Mr. Jones about control? There were very few things in his life at that moment that he felt that he could control, but participating in the treatment plan was one where he could indeed take a different path, a different road. There's definitely a part of control here that he had control over his own attendance and adherence. But in addition to that, there was an expertise that he had that we did not. And that was the expertise of his own life and his own body. And that was something that we hadn't taken time to explore with him. And uh, when it comes to a sense of control and uh, knowledge, 100% of the time it will help to stop and step back and reassess. Was that the pivotal moment for you when you decided to step back, perhaps seek some inspiration and say, I think we're doing this wrong. How can we help Mr. Jones make the right decision before it's too late? Yes, I think we all know the definition of insanity, right? And that's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And that's what we were doing. And it was about that time that Personally, I stepped back and, and thought I needed to look at this from a different angle. And I realized the one angle and perspective I hadn't taken was Mr. Jones's. And uh, so I asked if I could sit with him and talk and use curiosity and empathy as my two tools for the day uh, with no agenda, leaving it up to him to share. And that was the beginning of, of a process that, that we engaged in that allowed us to build a rapport and from there 
get a better understanding of, of where Mr. Jones wanted to go and, and allow him to share with us and then us to be able to adapt to his needs more appropriately. You actually admitted to Mr. Jones that he knew himself best and you offered the idea in essence by apologizing that you really hadn't listened to his side of the story and then, then you asked him to share more with you. What happened? Yes, I think admitting my missteps and, and the avoidance of, of listening to him was a big step in, in building that connection and showing some empathy, recognizing that I'm, I'm part of a team, a team that Mr. Jones was the leader of. Was it difficult for you to admit that you're wrong? I mean, to look him in the eye, perhaps lean forward and say, Mr. Jones, uh, I made a mistake. I'll say it, it felt uncomfortable because ultimately I recognized that, that I was true, that I had made some assumptions and, and started down a path without connecting with him. And that was about the time too, that Mr. Jones was starting to feel not well, that he was losing energy, that perhaps he heard the knock on the door and decided to make a decision. And what was that decision? He shared with me that, you know, he was starting to not feel so um, clear-minded mm. coming to dialysis only twice a week, that he wasn't feeling as energetic and more fatigued than he would like because he wanted an active lifestyle. I used all of my restraint to keep from saying, well, I know what you can do. And I simply asked him, what do you think would help? And that opened up possibilities for him to share without judgment, without my judgment. In fact, you also reflected, you mirrored his words, which indicates to the person on the other side, in this case to Mr. Jones, that you were listening, that you comprehended, you understood what he had to say. Definitely. Reflective listening is very, very powerful, and I believe it's a component of empathy. Empathy is, is that connection with another person. It's very patient or client-centered, and that's something that, that Satellite believes strongly in. Connecting with a patient using unconditional positive regard, that's a term that Carl Rogers, psychologist from the 1950s, coined that really speaks to allowing you to take a patient's perspective, promoting empathy and connection without judgment, but purely for the point of acceptance. And I think that this moment with Mr. Jones was a turning point in my career in recognizing my role as a social worker and with patients. You said to me to hear his own words repeated back to him really brought a much deeper awareness of how his behavior was essentially not only impacting his own health and well-being, but was also affecting others. I do feel that reflective listening, as simple as it can be, is extremely powerful. You have a poster on your wall, Emily, and I'd like to share that with our audience. It's entitled, As a Social Worker. May I read a few lines? Oh, I'd love you to. We are here to listen, not to work miracles. We are here to help people discover what they are feeling, not to make feelings go away. We are here to discuss steps with people, not to take steps for them. I can see why that poster is on your wall when you're looking for guidance, when perhaps you're trying to figure out what your next step along the path is. It's very helpful to be reminded of the basics and fundamentals of empathy and perhaps success. You know, every patient is different, every situation is different, and that poster is a reminder to me of that judgment-free zone that we need to, to stay within. Uh, we sent this poster out to all of our social workers, again, I love to look at it on my wall. It has this lovely natural image on it and just a great reminder of our work. My favorite line is that last one you read, that we are here to discuss steps with patients, not take steps for them. And I think that's part of gaining the perspective of the patient and helping them along their pathway, whichever direction that is. There's a universality about 
this poster, we could perhaps substitute other words for social worker, such as employer, colleague, parent, friend, neighbor. The, the universality of the message is very compelling and very powerful. It is, and I think at the heart of this is that everyone really is sort of doing the best that they can. And what our role as a healthcare provider, a friend, a family member, a social worker can be is to help them continue to do the best that they can, that we're not here to fix, we're here to support. I'm sure when your patients listen to the show, along with your colleagues, each side will gain a perspective of what is needed to communicate with intent, with purpose, and ultimately to be successful. I hope so. I, I hope to simply bring a reminder to the importance that empathy plays in our world. After a year of, of being isolated from many of our favorite people and activities, I think a simple reminder that human connection and connection to our own humanity and accepting one another where we are is, is as simple as reaching out and trying. And you try every day. Emily Watson, thank you so much for joining us on NAFTA. Thanks for having me, Christopher. I've truly enjoyed my time.